So welcome everybody to a, another Old Frontline podcast supporters evening. And as I mentioned, we're recording this uh, for people who can't make it tonight. So those of you who are watching this on kind of catch up, hello. And if anyone, um, considering we are recording it, if anyone doesn't want their picture in there, you need to kind of mute your camera and all that kind of stuff. Um, but um, I'm sure it'll be fine. So thank you for joining us once more. And uh, on our final one of 2023, and what we're going to do tonight is a kind of extension of a podcast episode I did the other week where we looked at kind of First World War memoirs. Um, I've got so many that, that could have I could have made that kind of multi-episode, really, and possibly I will come back to it and possibly I'll discuss some of those ones that I've got next to me here. But ne next to me on this table at the moment is a whole kind of pile of books, basically, like this. Um, and I'm just going to kind of talk through one or two of these um, because quite a few of these ones I've got here are some of the the lesser known ones. I mean, there's a few that you might recognize, but I think some of them are kind of lesser known ones. There are so many of these great war memoirs. And even now kind of, I mean, it's like 40 years I've been collecting these things. I still come across stuff that I haven't seen before, particularly when I'm crazy enough to uh, subscribe to Tom Donovan's book catalog, which is very dangerous for the bank account as could be this evening. So this does come with a kind of health, monetary health warning that so you might see one or two books and think, oh, I'd like to get those. And then you discover that they're, they're not exactly cheap. Most of these ones here tonight, I would say that you could probably get on eBay because e books on eBay never go for what they're worth unless they're really, I mean, you know, kind of first edition of Tolkien signed by him is, is not going to go for threepence on there or something like that. But uh, in terms of kind of great war books, you can get some real, bargains on there if you look and i'm astonished sometimes just how cheap some books are but um my one tip for it though is avoid the big book warehouses because the condition of some of their books that they send you uh can often be absolutely shocking and they don't always declare that they're ex-library copies and things like this so go for somebody who's kind of a private seller and uh and has got good feedback if you're looking for books. That's my top tip for tonight. And also people like Tom Donovan. I know I mentioned him a lot. I've known him for many, many years. He's a good guy. Um, but he's not the only book dealer out there. But he does produce a regular military book list with a lot of First World War stuff on it. And while you know his last catalogue had some really rare first editions in dust wrappers that were hundreds and hundreds of pounds, he does also have some more common books which are pretty affordable and he does quite a few fairs as well and he always has a kind of big stock that he takes along to those and there are one or two book fairs if you live up in the north when I was living in Elsica I used to go to the York, York book fair at the York race course which was very good and there's a few others across the UK that are kind of worth uh, uh, looking looking out for um, there's what is it the PBFA the uh, Association of Professional Booksellers they often have fairs around the UK and they're worth looking out for as well for secondhand stuff. So I'm, I'm basically telling you more and more ways to kind of spend your money now. So sorry about that. Sorry about that. So um, what I'll do is I'll uh, we'll go through these books and then um, I'll put something on Patreon and buy me a coffee, uh, like a reading list, because I, I haven't had a chance today with work to kind of do that i was going to do that and put it in the um the notes of this but i'll put it onto the those two platforms so if you want to if you can't remember what these books are and you want to go back to a reading list i'll put it on there in in due in due course so what i'm just going to do is go through them just talk about them i'm not going to kind of read massive well, and read any extracts from them that's kind of not practical in in the confines of this um but hopefully it kind of give you a good heads up on some books you haven't seen before so first up uh, uh, is this one here so this is uh not for glory and it's by um hagen turner who i think were teachers who in the 1970s tracked down a number of first world war veterans who had written accounts or had quite detailed diaries which they then went on to publish it's a bit of a mystery to me as to how these ended up being published because quite a small publishing house that did it um, and they published three of these. I wish they'd have done a lot more. This one um, and two others, one of which I mentioned in that podcast episode. That was Frank Dunham's The Long Carrier about a stretcher bearer in the 7th Londons. 
The other one is a diary of a guy called Hawkins, who was in the Queen Victoria Rifles, 9th London Regiment, and then was commissioned in the Royal Naval Division. And there's a really good account in that of the um, crossing of the, uh, well, the attack on the on the Hindenburg Line in September 1918. And then this one. Now, this one um, I got many, many years ago, long, probably 20 odd years ago, long before I ever set foot in Elsica. But this chap who's uh, this book is about was an Els Elskaterian, as someone once said on Twitter. So he was born in Elsica and he um, probably had a kind of life somehow connected to the collieries ahead of him. It didn't quite go that way. But he joined uh, when the war broke out, not the local territorial battalion, which I think for local lads was pretty full. That was the first, fifth York and Lanks. He went into Sheffield and he joined the Sheffield City Battalion. Now, he was slightly more middle class than most people living in Elsica. Um, so, and the Sheffield City Battalion was a kind of semi posh battalion in 1914. So, I can kind of guess why he did it. But he served with them in the ranks of 12th York and Lanks. And later on, he was commissioned in the King's Own Yorkshire Line Infantry. But this book covers the 12th York and Lanks early experiences from training up on the moors outside Sheffield, and then they moved to the Suez Canal in 1915, where they defended that uh, with the other powers battalions in their division, and then they're crossing to France, and then obviously first day of the Battle of the Somme. And this book was particularly good for me, because I don't know if I can kind of do this without tearing the thing out, but it's got a fold-out, you can see a bit of it, it's got a fold-out sketch map of the trenches at Serre. Now, we can go on the WFA trench mapper thing and, and do all that kind of stuff digitally now. Back in the day, books that had these kind of maps in them for me were gold dust because it meant that I could take that map with me across to the battlefields and try and figure out what that landscape was like today and, and how that related to 1915. And trench maps were not that easy to uh, to get hold of. But it's an excellent description. Um, in those years that I lived in Elsica, I kind of thought that he was buried there. There's a... in in the local town hall there's a list of all the men there's a big wooden board that lists every man from Hoyland and Elsica who served and he's on there and I used to go every time I went in there um, I uh, would always kind of brush my hand across that bit of the monument where he was it's behind glass so I wasn't doing any damage to it but um, uh, it's it's a great book and, and I had hoped that he was kind of buried in Elsica but I, I, I looked in every cemetery in the area uh, and he's not there so maybe they cremated him and scattered his ashes um, in one of the great Yorkshire rivers, who knows? But that's that's number that's that's what we're starting with. Not for glory, uh, by Hagen Turner, telling the story of a soldier and later an officer in the York and Lanks. And there is um, a picture of him, Gilbert Hall, his name was, and there's a nice portrait of him as an officer in the King's Own Yorkshire Line Infantry. So that's that one. And again, it's not a rare book, but it's not a hundred percent easy to find, but I don't think you'll have too much trouble. So this is the next one up. And this is another book that I've had many years, Schoolboy Into War by uh, H.E.L. Mellish. Now, Mellish uh, was a middle-class, again, middle-class family. Um, he went into the OTC and then he was commissioned into the East Lancashire Regiment. And that's a nice portrait of him as a subaltern there on the on the front cover. And he then joined in France in about uh, early 1916, the second battalion, the East Lanks, in the 8th Division. And they were getting prepared for um, operations on the Somme in 1916. Now, his battalion, and he didn't go into action on the 1st of July. But one of the things that uh, I, I kind of, when I first read this, I then traced on the ground. He was in a, one of the early attacks on Contel Maison when his battalion came up over the top of the rise on the right-hand part of Sausage Valley, and there's a great description of this in there, and they went down into what passed Bailiff Wood to, towards um, uh, Contour Maison itself. And it is a really great description, and you can literally trace his kind of assault on the ground today with this book in your hand, kind of reading his account of it. And it's quite a gentle book in many ways. Um, it, it, it goes on into 1917, and then like most of these men, he, he get, I think he gets sick, actually. Uh, and then that's the end of his war. But it's a book that I've taken with me many, many times to the battlefields and, and I've read many times. Um, and again, it's one of those ones. I think uh, I, there used to be a really great bookshop in Worthing 
um and that's where that came from um i remember i remember going in there a bit after it for some time and there it was sitting on the shelf um and i think it was something like it was like a pound i think something like that and in those days that's kind of what you used to pay for these kind of books they were no one wanted them really so mellish is good in particular for the somme um but you've got a good kind of account pretty honest account of of an officer's young officer's service he's not uh, he's not a Siegfried to soon or an Edmund Blunden or Wilfred Owen he's just an ordinary subaltern I mean they weren't all men who were either kind of either greatly for the war or anti-war or you know had great political aspirations or whatever they were men who were there to do their duty just like the ordinary soldiers in the ranks and and books like that I think are, are pretty good for kind of conveying um, that kind of thing and, and it's a great read it really is a great read schoolboy into war and when you look kind of look at the picture of him i don't know if i can hold that any closer i mean he does does look like a schoolboy on there he's a he's a wee bairn as they might say uh in certain places um and it kind of reminds me of, of several of the officers that i veterans who i interviewed who were similar kind of age I mean, he's 18 on there um and i remember kind of one who was always indignant he was kind of 18 in command of a platoon of raw fusiliers in the 18th eastern division uh, and he was kind of kind of indignant, you know, when, whenever questioned as to what was his qualification for leading those men, having gone straight from school into uh, becoming an officer. He, he said, well, I, I was their officer. And there was no question of me not leading them. I was their officer. It was as simple as that. Uh, and it was kind of ingrained in them, really. Um, but, you know, I mean, he admits in there that he was, you know, kind of not exactly the healthiest specimen. And um, he reminds me quite a lot of Jimmy Lovegrove. He was another veteran I knew who uh, was in the South Lancashire Regiment, uh, who was so weedy that when he he, he went to a, went and bought his officer's kit um, and uh, he bought a Colt because he'd, he'd read cowboy uh, magazines as a kid and he saw a Colt pistol instead of a Webley one. He thought, oh, I'll be like a cowboy, I'll get a Colt pistol. And it was this big 455 Colt. And <laughs> when he took it home, before he went on, went back to, to barracks, uh, he could hardly pick this thing up. And and the one time he fired it, he fell over uh, because of the recoil of it. So he never fired it again. And when he took it into action, every time it was unloaded uh, because he just he didn't trust himself to accidentally not discharge the thing into someone's back or um, or shoot himself accidentally with it. Or if he fired it anyway, he'd fall over. So he just carried it empty. And he never once fired a shot in anger during all the months that he spent on the front line until he was wounded. So anyway, schoolboy at the war. H.E.L. Mellish, great song book. Now, another great song book, these aren't all going to be by about officers, uh, is this one, which is a very, very, um, not very well-known book about the First World War. It's privately published um, in the 1980s by a guy called Tam Nash about his father, and it's based on his father's diaries. It's called The Diary of an Unprofessional Soldier, and he was an officer in the 19th Manchester Regiment. Um, so down uh, on the southern sector of the front, on the Somme, in the lead up to the battle, there's a lot about that. They go across in 1915 and they occupy that sector to the south around Maricourt, facing Montauban and Mametz. And then they go into action on the 1st of July. And the account of the attack on the 1st of July in here is one of the best that I've ever read, where he goes into a really huge amount of detail about the attack on the village of Montauban getting into Montauban itself and getting through to the trenches, Montauban Alley at the back of the village, which they did and linked up with uh, the un other units within their uh, within their brigade and, and division. And one of his mates went into action with a camera on the 1st of July and took photographs in action as they were going over and when they got into the German trenches. And there's one of those in here, one of, must be one of, the, only a handful of photographs taken by men on the ground actually in action on the 1st of July. And that picture is uh, is in here. Again, I'm, I'm not sure if I can uh, kind of get that to, to show properly, but uh, uh, by the end of the war, he'd lost all of his best mates. And Tam Nash, who was um, the, the chap, who was a Second World War veteran, who I bought this from, who used to come around the WFA um, branches and uh, sell these books. I think they were... A, something silly like about a tenner. Um, his initials, T-A-M, were the Christian names of his father's three friends. Uh, no, let's get this right. No, there was three lads killed, 
and each one of them, their their names, their Christian names, was the names of those officers who died. So Tam Nash was named after one of the men who'd been killed, I think, at Arras, if I remember correctly, and his two brothers were named after other fellow um, fellow officers. Just bear with me while I just if I can find this. There it is. So it's it's a kind of cheaply produced book, um, but it's brilliant. I don't know if you can kind of see that very well. That's a picture of one of his officers who was later killed um, standing in a German trench on the at Montauban on the 1st of July. Um, so it's it, it's not going to win an award for book design, this, um, but in terms of the kind of historical record um, and the importance of this kind of thing, I mean, I, I've seen in the last couple of days tweets about um, um, the kind of the value of personal testimony and first-hand account and eyewitness account, you know, it always comes with a caveat. But I think it depends on what you want to get from it. And it's the same with all these memoirs. If you want to kind of read about uh, the strategic elements of warfare and, and, and the kind of grand tactical schemes, sometimes they kind of touch on that stuff. You're not always going to get that. And if you want to kind of get a, if you're writing some kind of insightful academic paper on the war, I don't think these books are going to serve you much good. But if you're interested in the human experience of war, and you want to understand what kind of life in these units was like and the hierarchy of these units and, and how it worked between officers and their men and the men and their officers and, uh, you know, who was the most hated man in a battalion, normally the quartermaster, um, then <laughs> these are the kind of books that are going to tell you those, those kind of things. So if you want a kind of an immersive understanding of something like the Great War, that's what memoirs are good for. And if you want to then kind of link what is in these books to the landscape today, many of these books are great for that because, again, this one's like that. There's a lot of sketch maps in there which you can then go onto the landscape with and think, you know, that's where Lieutenant Nash moved up into Montabar Alley and you can kind of stand on that spot and you can read that account from this book and I think that kind of adds quite a lot to, a lot to it. This book is long out of print. I don't think it will ever be reprinted because poor old Tam Nash, uh, I think he'd be over 100 um, now if he was still alive. He'd served in Italy in the in the Second World War. But uh, again, I, I see copies of this now and again. It, it never goes for a lot of money, but it is one of, if, you, if you're looking for a good buy, um, you know, something you will not regret, you will not regret buying this, this book, The Diary of an Unprofessional Soldier, a Young Subaltern. And he had a short life, sadly, because... He'd gone through all that. He'd lost all his best mates. He'd survived the war, come home, married, and he had three sons. And and then about 20-odd years after the war, his wounds, and particularly his gas, he was gassed in 1917, his wounds caught up with him, and he died really, you know, a relatively a young man, um, as did many of these these soldiers, and they were never really the same again, either physically or, or otherwise. So a great book. Certainly one of my favourites, um, that one. The uh, the next one, which is a kind of a probably a bit better known, um, sadly this is not a first edition, um, and that's uh, A Devil in the Drum by Lucy. John Lucy was a, a Southern Irishman, and this is an edition from the 1990s with an introduction by Terry Cave, who some of you may or may not know. Terry uh, lived in Worthing, and he used to be uh, the historical information officer for the WFA. And he wrote a lot, Western Front Association, he wrote a lot of um, kind of booklets and histories and he, he wrote regular columns in Stand 2, real kind of mine of information. He was a Gurkha officer in Italy in World War II, really, really interesting guy. And his son is Nigel Cave, who some of you may know, uh, who's the editor of a lot of the Battleground Europe books and has written quite a few of those uh, himself. Anyway, Terry Cave kind of wrote the introduction to this. And another chap called Gerald Glidden, um, provided the original copy of this. Gerald Clidden was, uh, he lived in Norfolk and he had a really un kind of unrivaled collection of Great War memoirs and books, first editions. Um, and this book was unobtainable. I, I think I've only ever seen one first edition and, and I certainly was not in a position to afford to buy it. Um, so this kind of reprint, which is itself now sadly out of print, I think there might be a more um recent printing of it but it's worth looking out for but it's a cracking book lucy was a southern irishman he was a catholic and he decided to go up to um i mean ireland was one country then but he started to go up to north what was 
to, well, it's today Northern Ireland and joined the Royal Irish Rifles um, in a British regiment because he was sick of kind of the whole aspect of religion and he just wanted to get into a regiment where he could just be himself and he didn't want to serve with uh, people from the south basically although i think he, as he discovered there was quite a few people like him who felt the same and there was quite a few men from the south in that uh, in that battalion and he's a regular soldier pre-war regular soldier he goes across i think his battalion is uh, part of the sixth division and they go across and it uh, starts with the withdrawal from um, mons and Lucato, and then goes down to the Aisne and the marne or the marne and the Aisne. and the stuff on the Aisne in particular is really great um i've trumped around there with this um, following him on the heights around Siobhan and all these other places. This fantastic descriptions. And his brother was killed in action uh, during that period as well, which he, he writes about in here. And then the book goes on into the, the early stages of static trench warfare, a bit about the offensives of 1915. And then that's, you know, kind of, that's it really. So it's a really important book of the early period of the great war, the establishment of the Western front, um, and uh, the insight uh, from an ordinary soldier's perspective of serving in the ranks of the regular army. Now, you know, we've got Old Soldiers Never Die by Frank Richards, who was in the Royal Welsh Fusiliers, is a good kind of comparative volume to this. But Lucy, it should it, it's a much better written book. Um, you know, no disrespect to Frank Richards, who I've got a lot of time for, but uh, he was a Welsh miner, working class lad, and had to be helped greatly to write that book by either Robert Graves at Seafree Tassoon or possibly both of them. Lucy is a very different character and, and what shines across is his ability to write in this. And it is a beautiful book in, in many respects and, and his prose in it is really fantastic. Um, and I mean, you know, there's a devil in the drum kind of gives you an, an insight into his mind. The devil in the drum is, is the, you know, the sound of war, the rumble of conflict in the distance that's coming and, and they're all heading on an inevitable path towards it. Um, so it, to me, it's a classic and it's one that is should be much, much better known. Um, you know, over the years, I've seen a few people um, to uh, kind of triumph it, trying to get interest in it. The late Professor Richard Holmes in particular um, was a great um, admirer of Lucy's work. I think it's in his book, Tommy. He quotes from it quite extensively. But it should be out there and, and may well be a podcast episode of Dispatches or something like that about this. Uh, in due course, uh, because he's an interesting character, Lucy. So that that's, uh, you know, for a kind of working class, Southern Irish, from the ranks perspective of a regular soldier in the early battles of the Great War, that is definitely one of the classics to uh, to kind of seek out. And it shouldn't cost you an arm and a leg. I think Naval and Military did that. Maybe they still do a version of that. I don't know. They publish so many books, it's kind of difficult to, uh, to keep on top of them sometimes. Um, uh, which is not a bad thing. We, these kind of books need to be out there. So the next two have both got the same title. Uh, two Lots of Poor Bloody Infantry. Um, so they're two completely different books. Poor PBI, Poor Bloody Infantry, common um, phrase for those in the ranks. And um, because they felt they were the ones kind of doing the donkey work. And often, of course, they were. Uh, and I, I remember um, uh, John Dray, who I often speak about on the podcast, um, he he had a phrase which I won't entirely repeat, um, but uh, he used to say that you were either infantry or you were nothing. But uh, he didn't say nothing. He said a lot, lot kind of worse than nothing. But um, his view was that having been in the infantry, that everybody else was kind of they were just bit parts in the war, and the the real war was where the infantry was. So you know you know you get these 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 phrases like thousand mile snipers for gunners and. You know, runaway mothers coming and rob all my comrades for the medical corps and all this kind of stuff. And it's only the PBI, the poor bloody infantry, are doing the job. Anyway, that to one side. These are two very different books. Um, Bernard Martin's PBI, poor bloody infantry, came out in the 1980s, I think. Yeah, 87, that was published by John Murray. Um, and I remember I bought this in a bookshop in Crawley when I still uh, when I was a student. And it had just come out. It's incredible then. I mean, it's difficult to think of it now because bookshops, you know, even we don't have as many bookshops now, but there's a lot of military titles in them. In those days, believe me, there wasn't. And to see a Great War book suddenly come out like that was really quite something. Anyway, it came out and I bought it. And he was in, I think it was either the 8th or the 9th South Staffordshire Regiment. And it starts with him going across to Epe in 1916 as a as an officer, as second lieutenant, as a 
picture of him there on the um, on the back cover. That's him standing up, and uh, he then goes uh, into a deep salient in a quiet period in that about halfway through that two year period um, when the static trench warfare at Ypres between the end of the second battle of Ypres and the beginning of the third one. And he goes to Popperinger and he goes to Talbot House. It's quite a lot about Talbot House in here. So it's always nice when you kind of dip into these memoirs, you can find references to that um, because it was, you know, a place that men went to on a regular basis, religious or not. They went there kind of often out of curiosity because they'd heard so much um, about it. And uh, so there's quite a lot about that. And then he, he his battalion goes off and he comes back and he takes part in the third Battle of Ypres. Um, in some of the fighting around Shrewsbury Forest, and there's quite a, a good account of that in there as well. So we've had, you know, quite a few Somme books there. This is very much an Ypres salient book. So if you're interested in the war in Flanders from different perspectives, from a quiet period through to the kind of big operations of 1917, then um, this is this is kind of worth having a, a look at. And not a rare book. I don't think it sold very well when it came out, 1987. Believe me, I mean, the Western Front Association was only a few years old. Um, and I remember it got a very good review in Stand 2. But there just wasn't a number of people kind of buying these books then. So they often just disappeared. And they used to end up in kind of remainder bookshops as they were in, in those days. And I remember there were several of those kind of things down in Brighton. And often had big, big piles of these recent Great War titles, some of which now are incredibly rare books. Um, so uh, worth looking out for. So that's that. Poor bloody infantry, Bernard Martin, poor bloody infantry, um, and he's an officer in the South Staffordshire Regiment. A subaltern on the Western Front, 1916-17, is the kind of subtitle to that one. The other one is this one, Poor Bloody Infantry, by William Groom, Bill Groom. Um, although I think he was called Archie, if I can remember. I met him, he was a member of the Western Front Association, and he came along to the uh, WFA meetings up in London, on a regular basis in the early 1980s. Uh, in those days, it was in the National Army Museum. In if you, they still have that little lecture theatre there, which is downstairs, kind of towards the back. And as you went into the the door of it, there was a kind of stage area, and then there was the, all the seats laid out in rows. And the first three rows of it were reserved for veterans. The first three rows. So uh, you go in there, and there's. <laughs> 20 or more Great War veterans. And they were ones that were known by John Giles and Terry Cave and Richard Dunning and so on. Um, and this book, at that time, Richard Dunning, who is the owner of the Lochnagar crater on the Somme, um, was in publishing. Um, or he was in, I think, he might have had a, a marketing agency, but he, had, he, he developed a publishing offshoot and he republished one of John Giles's books about Eep, Eep Then and Now. And he published this, it's Piccadilly Publishing. Um, and there is an earlier version of this, which is incredibly difficult to find. But anyway, this was re reprinted. And it, he was in the London Rifle Brigade. So he was an ordinary soldier, a rifleman in the 1st, 5th London Regiment um, in the 56th London Division. And it covers the Somme um, through to uh, through to Eep. There's, he was a conscript um, soldier so uh, he went out right at the end of 1916 and then served on the western front 17 18 so it's important in that respect because there aren't that many published memoirs by conscripts most of the people who published their memoirs after the war were volunteers or regular soldiers who were of course volunteers and i think there's probably a reason there and i think you know men who were not forced to go in the army, perhaps thought about their service in a different way. And those that were conscripted, um, you know, if we think of the last fight in Tommy, Harry Pax, he didn't want to go into the army. He had no interest really in fighting the war. He was there as a kind of reluctant soldier in many respects. And uh, when the war was over and he'd survived and been wounded and came back, he didn't want anything to do with it. He, he threw his medals away. I mean, if you ever met him he wore a pair of medals but they were reissued to him because he'd thrown his original British War and Victory medals away and I mean he wasn't alone in that I mean there were many men who chucked their medals in the sea or the river or in the dustbin or whatever it was um, they didn't all want to be there but to have a book written by a conscript is, is a more unusual thing so it's it's quite useful for that that respect now we mentioned about the kind of fragility sometimes of personal testimony 
And that's a kind of one of the weaknesses of this book. It was written many, many years after the war. You can sense the authors read quite a lot about different aspects of the war. You can see a kind of um, a few misinterpretations of of what actually happened in the war kind of creeping in here and there and quite a lot of speculation and what I would call kind of estamine stories about the war where a group of soldiers have sat around and they've discussed something and, you know, one, one minute it's it's a soldier saying to his officer he, he had a sore foot and the next minute he's it's half a battalion refusing to go up the line to fight. It's those kind of uh, stories. So you've got to be kind of a little bit more aware of it. And I think it it kind of points to the issues that we have with with personal testimony and, and eyewitness accounts and that they can't be taken as gospel. And, and the same with veterans. I mean, you know, most of the men that I interviewed did not exaggerate their war service. Some did uh, and some told complete and utter lies or uh, said things that they may well have believed. But I, <laughs> I knew at the time, let alone now, um, that they um, that they didn't happen. Uh, that was much rarer with First World War veterans, um, much more common with Second World War. Um, you know, you get men who in Royal Army Service Corps petrol units who brought petrol in two months after D-Day and then they'll tell you how they took on a tiger tank. Uh, in the Bocage and things like that. So you, you get kind of more of that in World War Two. I think because less men were really actually in the very kind of sharp end of the war. So maybe in the First World War, you didn't really need to exaggerate your service because if you've been in the trenches and you've been in a battle like the Somme or Arras or Passchendaele, um, there was no need to embellish about what had happened because it was going to always be a, be a good story one way uh, or another. Um, so you've got to be kind of careful of it. But like I said at the beginning, it's kind of what, what do you want from this? What do you want from these these guys? Um, and there's probably a whole kind of study in that, really, as to what their testimony tells us and, and what misinformation in publications like this tell us as well about how soldiers thought about their experience and, and I guess, process that experience in, uh, in, a, in a kind of way as well. But... Although I've, you know, kind of not knocked it down, having met the old boy, who was a very charming old fella, um, it's still a book worth reading and, and one that I would always recommend. You know, it, it's, I've read plenty of books on the First World War that I've absolutely hated, but I've never regretted reading them because it's always interesting to get kind of different perspectives. Um, and that's certainly not a book that I hate. I'm, I'm kind of thinking more of the general accounts of the First World War. So that's, um, and before I get overwhelmed by books here, uh, put those two PBIs to one side. So that book came out as Piccadilly Publishing in, uh, I would guess, about 1983. It was originally published in 1976 and then republished by Richard Dunning um, 1983. So they used to sell it. The WFA had big stockpiles of it and they used to sell it, but I don't, I don't believe they have it now. I'll come back to Great War Veterans of the WFA at the end. We'll have that as our kind of last stop. Um, so uh, I'm conscious as well, I want to give uh, some of you some time to talk about books as well. So one of our last few books now. Now, this is another one that is not very well known. This is Letters from France, 1915 to 1918 by Lancelot Dykes Spicer. Spicer was a, an officer in the 9th Battalion, King's Own Yorkshire Line Infantry. Uh, he'd end the war with a Distinguished Service Order and a Military Cross as a Brigade Major and it's a great, it's based on his letters, but there's a kind of, there's little bits that he's added in between some of the letters where he's given some kind of wider perspective. It was published um, privately in the, in 1979. And, and I, there's a, there's a picture of him there. And the battalion that he was in is the famous 9th Battalion King's Own Yorkshire Infantry, which I've spoken about a few times in the podcast, who assembled for the Somme prior to the 1st of July. And there was this occasion in which they were asked to toast their commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Lynch. And they weren't very keen on it because Lynch had got a DSO at Luz. And some of them thought that he didn't deserve it. And he, didn't, he wasn't a very popular commanding officer. And Captain Greenwell, I think it was, stepped forward and proposed another toast, which was, gentlemen, when the barrage lifts. And that they could all toast to. So they toasted it. And uh, that story would not be known to us without Spicer and without this book. Spicer, every year on the 1st of July, up until his death, in the Times, put that entry, 
on the anniversary of the song. So every 1st of July, there would be a little um, notation in the Times uh, where he would put gentlemen when the barrage lifts in memory of the officers and men of the 9th Battalion, King's Own Yorkshire Light Infantry. And that would be his own kind of personal way to remember his comrades. And in here, he tells the full story of it. And uh, without that book, and you know, we wouldn't really kind of know some of these things. Sometimes these stories are purely kind of accidental. And I kind of tipped into this book through picking up a picture of those officers. Spicer is in that photograph. And uh, and, and then researching it and kind of uncovering uh, the story of it. And um, you'll hear me talk about, uh, we've got a Christmas um, edition of Dispatches coming out next Saturday. Uh, and you'll hear me talking about a little chateau at La Nouvelle at Corby on the Somme, uh, where there was a photographic studio. And the officers of the 9th King's Own Yorkshire Infantry were photographed there. Um, and that's how I ended up with this picture with this very distinctive background with these pillars of the, the balustrade uh, the back of the chateau with the steps of it, which the officers and the men used to sit on. And over the years since, I've found many, many other photographs taken on that spot um, and tracked down the actual building, which is still there, uh, used as social housing these days. It's right near the railway station at La Nouvelle, uh, which is probably why it was so popular, men coming and going on trains, could nip in there to get their photograph taken. Anyway, Spice's book, is is it's not kind of a gripping yarn, but there's a lot of little insightful bits where he dips into key battles because the 9th Battalion, King's Own Yorkshire Line Infantry, first day of the Battle of the Somme, they remained on the Somme area, fought around Fleurs, where they went into action in September 1916, and then they moved up to Arras, and there's a lot about the the, the fighting on the Hindenburg line as well. And, and he was a brave officer. Uh, he was a man who, as well, uh, was very proud a generation later to see his son be commissioned in the same regiment in the King's Own Yorkshire Line Infantry. And I think he mentioned it briefly in there. And then many, many years ago, I was at Anzio War Cemetery, and Anzio a place special to me because that's where my dad was. And I was walking along the road. And there's a lot of men um, in, in the Beachhead Cemetery there, rather, not the Anzio War Cemetery. There's a lot of men in there with the, of the King's Own Yorkshire Line Infantry. And I just suddenly stopped at a grave, and there was Spicer's son. He's buried, he was killed at Anzio doesn't mention it in the book, but he was killed at Anzio. And when I looked in the register, son of Brigadier L.D. Spicer, uh, DSOMC. Um, so Spicer's son was killed at Anzio a generation later. And I often wonder how men like him must have thought to see a son march off to war and and not come back. And, and the irony, you know, he went through three years of trench warfare and his son was put into one of the most static parts of the Italian campaign in trenches, just like his dad, and, and and he didn't survive that experience of of that kind of warfare. So, a kind of hidden gem, really, a forgotten book, but a really, really good one. And then the 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 last um, officer's account, um, and again, an old favourite of mine, and it's the Burgoyne Diaries. And he was an officer in the Royal Irish Rifles, I think, again, 6th Division, um, who served um, uh, in the early phase of the war. This book came out. 1985 it was published by a publisher called spell spell mount i think originally and it says thomas armsworth in there but there may be another edition of it um it's based on his diaries they were kind of uh, enlarged upon um later on and it gives a really kind of good description of the southern part of the eep salient so the kind of creation of trench warfare and then the front facing the messines ridge and a lot about the front line areas just outside kemmel and it's a great little book to tie into um, the, the diary of um, Private Fraser, Donald Fraser's memoirs as a Canadian, the 31st Canadian. He arrived basically as Burgoyne pulled out. And um, so you can kind of look at that southern part of the Ypsilanti in the first two years of the war when it was all static warfare, a few little minor actions. And you've, you've got a really good account from a, an officer of the regular army at the beginning. And then you can tie into a lot of the places that he mentions in here. Um, with Donald Fraser's account as an ordinary soldier in the 31st Canadians when um, when he arrived in that sector. And there's there's kind of the other nice thing about it is that it, there's, there's these sketches in there as well. So you've got a lot of these little sketches that he did uh, when he went round showing the men in his unit and the cooks and so on um, and various aspects of, of trench warfare. I'd like to think someone has kind of preserved the originals of these somewhere or other, but um, I'm not sure 
where they would be. Um, but um, so there, there's another kind of these these kind of village scenes and so on. I mean, they're, they're not you know he's not he's not Picasso. He's not some great artist. He's not John Nash or anyone like that. But these are kind of honest soldiers sketches. Um, and it's a great little book, great little book. These books about soldiers, the regular army period of the war has always fascinated me. And these memoirs, and many were there, and you can follow the regular army around some of these places, are really, really good to kind of get into um, because it was a kind of an army that was the red little dead little army, as Henry Williamson called it, uh, that was about to disappear. And these men were kind of the last vestiges of it. And the, and the book peters out in the early part of 15, yeah, um, after the second Battle of Ypres. Um, that's him kind of done with trench warfare and, and and that's it. And I think he ended up in somewhere like Abyssinia, if I remember correctly, many years later. And yeah, he, he, here we are. He died in 1936, bombed by the Italian Air Force as he and his mules escorted a Red Cross unit in the north of Ethiopia. So again, a kind of sad end to a man who had gone through those momentous years of the uh, of the Great War. Um, so yeah, great, great little book. So the, the one I'm going to, the ones I'm going to end with, um, is, well, it's, it's one and a half books really. <laughs> uh, so one and a half books, Norman Gladden, Norman Gladden, uh, wrote three books on the great war, the Somme 1916, Eat 1917, and, uh, this one here, which eeps upstairs, but I, I brought across the Piave as well. And it covers his experiences with the Northumberland Fusiliers from the Battle of the Somme in 1916 through to the Third Battle of Ypres, and then when his unit went to Italy in the last phase of the Great War. And I had the pleasure of knowing Norman Gladden. Again, I met him in those days when he'd go into the Western Front meetings in London, and there'd be those multiple rows of veterans sitting on those chairs. And they are very, some of them are just ordinary. I say ordinary, none of them were ordinary, but they were kind of ordinary vets who'd just done their bit and so on. But amongst them was a whole host of great war authors. Uh, and, and it's just, when I look back, and it's so extraordinary to think that these people were there and you kind of got a chance to meet them. Charles Carrington, Herbert Saltzbach, and Norman Norman Gladden. And um, so at the time, I'd never seen these books, but I, I kind of went to the first Western Front meeting and met Norman Gladden and started kind of talking to him. And then I went to a bookshop in Brighton and that's when I picked up a paperback. They used to have these kind of paperback exchanges in Brighton and I picked up this copy of Across the Piave. Now, they, they never published this in, in a hardback edition, only in paperback. And it's actually not a, an easy book to get hold of. Um, I think that most people did not associate the Great War and the British Army with Italy. They had no idea that the British Army was even in Italy during the Great War. And I don't think this book sold. A book with the Somme 1916 on the cover, yeah, people were going to buy that, but not uh, a book about the Piave. But I mean, what is the Piave? Is it a piano? Is it is it a river? Is it, um, you know, what is it? Um, it's a river, of course. But, um, uh, but this is a great kind of account of that forgotten part of the First World War that the British Army was involved in. Um, and unfortunately, I, I, when Norman Gladden died in about 1984, I still hadn't got hold of a copy of that. But I did get Norman to very kindly sign this one. And it is a, although it's a cheap paperback, it's nice to kind of have a book. There he is, there's a kind of sketch of him there. Nice to be signed by, by dear old Norman. He was an extraordinary guy. Um, and one of the things that he, he got quite bad, and he describes it in here, he got quite bad trench foot on the Somme in 1916. And he, he really, when I went to interview him, he gave a much more gruesome account of it than it is in this book. And he said he had to kind of edit the book, really, because he felt he couldn't upset his audience with the gruesome details of what happened to men when they got trench fought. I mean, he saw one bloke unstrapping, he'd be hobbling along. The army would march for an hour, and then they'd have a 10-minute break. So the first hour of this march, this guy's hobbling along, hobbling along, one bloke's carrying his rifle, the other two men on either side are holding him up as they're kind of dragging him along. And they get to the point where the hour's up and they've got a 10 minute break. They go to the side of the road. This bloke just collapses. They call over the regimental stretcher bearers and he's screaming, It's my feet, it's my feet. And one of them undoes his boots. And these are kind of tough old, rough old ammo boots they had in those days, undoes his boots. And as he pulls the boot off, most of his foot comes off with it. Um, and it led to a double amputation of the lower part of his. 
of his leg and the end of his war. So Norman hints at that. I mean, he, he that wasn't him. This is a guy in his unit, but he doesn't give the kind of much more detailed description in here because he felt that perhaps modern audiences weren't ready for that kind of thing. But it was the grim, grim reality of living in sodden trenches with boots which you could not prevent water coming into and um uh, and kind of you know i mean if you put your hand in your in your sink when you're doing your washing up too long you sit in the bath too long you know what your kind of skin goes like you imagine standing in water for days and days and days at a time and your boots are full of it and your feet are soaked in it that's kind of you know that was the beginnings of it but these are ordinary soldier um he goes right through the war as an ordinary soldier so you've got another view from the ranks and they are incredibly important books in that respect giving us an insight into the two great battles of the war the somme in 1916 and his volume on eat which has got a nice green cover with a outline of the cloth hall uh, at ypres on the uh, on the front cover um and then he's one on uh on italy the the piave so uh that's where we'll kind of end with my i feel like it's top of the pops we've just reached number one um but so that's kind of <laughs> where uh, where we'll end with those. I mean, there's there's a there's a, there's so many more that we could uh, talk about. Maybe we'll come back to that a, another day some more. Um, but they are to me. We often used to say in the days before guidebooks, because you can remember go back to the early 1980s. There was only one guidebook. Um, I mean, there were there are older. There were older guidebooks. If you were lucky to get old of, you could get get. But there was only one guidebook, and that was before Endeavours Fade by Rose Coombs. Um, so we we kind of were not spoilt in the same way that we are spoilt now with guidebooks on just about everything. So we used to call these kind of books the the Bibles. These are the things that we used to navigate the Western Front battlefields by because it was difficult to get all the war diaries, difficult to get all the trench maps. And with these kind of books, which you could get in the the, the plethora of of secondhand bookshops that then existed, I mean they were everywhere. Um, even in Crawley Newtown, when I where I grew up, there were two second-hand bookshops in Crawley. Um, you know, I don't think there's even a bookshop there now, maybe there is, but, that, you know, it's kind of, the world has changed dramatically. But these books were so useful to kind of getting an insight into the experience of, of that war, what it was like to be in the trenches, the kind of food that they ate and the things that they did and what they thought about different aspects of it and the difference between them in the front line and the people at home. And then some of them would describe the landscape so well that you could go there and you could kind of picture it and follow it and almost transcribe their words onto that modern landscape, particularly if they very kindly added a few kind of sketch maps in there um, as well. So there we are. That's um, uh, that's where we are for, for a few memoirs. And I'll open up the floor. Um, to you guys, uh, if you kind of want to contribute as well. And I'm just going to stop recording at that point. Bear with me for a minute.